Welcome to the conversation on TYT. I'm, uh, you know, I'm excited today to be talking about a subject that, uh, while it's not an exciting subject necessarily, and one that we wish we didn't have to talk about as much, it's one that I have spent a good deal of my time, both as a journalist in the field and a journalist uh, on, uh, you know, on the TYT at a desk, talking about, and that's the issue of guns. And I'm thrilled to invite. And, uh, and be talking to Frank Smythe, who has uh, written a book, the NRA, The Unauthorized History. And whenever you see the word unauthorized, which I know uh, they want uh, you to see that word, uh, it, it makes it all the more intriguing. Frank, thanks for being here on, uh, on TYT today. Let's, let's start with that, because I did. I mean, first of all, I should also set this up. Talking about guns, it, today when we are recording this is the 155th anniversary of one of the uh, most famous or infamous, I should say, gun shots in American history. Abraham Lincoln uh, was shot and killed uh, today, or shot and then killed later, but uh, he was shot at Ford's Theater 155 years ago today. So we are still, all these many years later, trying to figure out what to do about guns in this country. Frank, uh, unauthorized, tell me why, of course, that's a, a compelling word. Tell me why that's important here. The reason I chose that, Michael, is that the there are only two book-length histories of the NRA in print until my book, the NRA, the Unauthorized Histories. And those first two book-length histories are each authorized histories approved by the National Rifle Association itself. The first one was released in 1967, before the NRA underwent what's called within its own lore the Cincinnati Revolt, when it embraced gun rights in an unyielding manner, according to its own terms. And that book is hard to find now. It's out of print. You don't see it on any other any NRA displays. It's not on his, their website. It's as if they don't want anybody to know it exists. And then the second authorized history by the NRA came about uh, in 2002, so some 35 years later. And that, uh, that book had a forward by the spy thriller author Tom Clancy. That was authorized. That book is, still exists. But I noticed the gap between the 67 version and the 2002 version. The 67 version had some very interesting materials, including the debts or the fact that the NRA was formed and based on and borrowed its entire original shooting system, scoring design, target designs, as well as its very name verbatim from the National Rifle Association of the United Kingdom, which was formed 12 years before. That was completely whitewashed out of the 2002 version. So I realized there was a great deal more that was whitewashed. So I decided to, to write their history and to call it the unauthorized history, but it's really their untold story according to them. That's it. I mean, because the book has over 650 endnotes, but the most important of which are the NRA documents and magazines. And you're, I mean, just to give a little of your, um, of, of your biography, uh, you are someone who has been exposing uh, the unexposed for a very long time. I feel like, uh, and, and nothing against radiologists, but I feel like a radiologist talking to a brain surgeon here. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm such a brave journalist that I will go into Iowa and stand four feet from a candidate with a microphone out, and you are someone who has infiltrated gorillas in El Salvador, been to Africa, uh, covered wars, and, and I, I stand in awe of that experience. But also, uh, it, the fact that it's all related, it's all about uncovering things that we don't know about, that other people don't want us to know about. And the NRA uh, is so cloak and dagger, or, or cloak and pistol. I, I, I'm, I'm curious as to uh, when the NRA that we know now, the one that seems to have a stranglehold on government, changed from what the NRA was before that, when it was a far more anonymous organization. That occurred in 1977. In 1968, there was the Gun Control Act passed that year in response to the assassinations of President John F. Kennedy, Mal Martin Luther King, and also Bobby Kennedy just months before. And this law banned the sale of interstate mail order guns like one rifle that had been tied to the assassination of JFK. And the NRA at the time supported that law. A group within the NRA saw that as treason, and other activists outside the NRA did as well. The gun rights movement, the modern gun rights movement, was formed in the early 70s in the wake of this law, first with the Citizens Committee for the Right to Keep and Bear Arms, then Gun Owners of America, and then the NRA had this shift, as their president called it in a speech in Moscow more recently, 
where they shifted from an organization that was focused primarily on marksmanship and supporting hunters to one that still did those things but made the gun rights that's overwhelming driving uh, ideology and its driving mandate, which has continued to this day. Was this, and I don't ask this naively, was this an accidental power grab in any way or was this totally motivated and, and, and planned out in order to change the organization so that they could do uh, what they have continued to do over the, over the ensuing decades? This was completely planned in advance. Two men, a man named Harlan Carter and Neil Knox, planned for years uh, a plan on taking over the organization. And Harlan Carter became the figurehead, the man who was elected the new leader of the NRA in Cincinnati in 1977. But Neil Knox had organized his followers largely through his own gun magazine columns outside of the NRA, outside of the American Rifleman, the NRA's monthly, through, gun, through magazines like Guns and Ammo and others. And he got more than 500 NRA members to arrive in Cincinnati who were eligible to vote and then had his lieutenants out in the audience with walkie-talkies directing them how to vote under his command to go through a series of parliamentary procedures which first attacked the old guard for being allegedly soft on gun rights, and they even had secret uh, audio recordings that they played, then fired the old guard one by one, and then got the, got the floor to then elect them to take over the organization. So it was planned in advance, and really it was a... Uh, something of a coup d'etat nine years in the works. And, and a, a real success story. I mean, I, you know, you hate to say it that way, but uh, it's a remarkable thing that they've accomplished and it's unmatched almost. Uh, I would say almost. I can't, I think it might be unmatched in American political activism uh, that, that one organization has this kind of control over so many people. It, it talk to me a little bit about the evolution of that, but also is it waning in any way, or is it just as strong, if not stronger, than it was yesterday and the day before? It's, well, three things. First of all, it's been effective on its own terms. It's, it's the most powerful civic organization in the United States. NRA members, NRA gun activists, and others who follow the NRA's lead are incredibly active in voting on elections. And the NRA has created something which is both a fellowship a community of gun owners who are very much united around the notion of gun rights and at the same time uh, engages in lobbying uh, in Washington and other states around the world. They've also been successful in suppressing and burying their own history. They claim that they are the oldest civil rights organization in the nation. This is not true. That's the National Association of the Deaf, founded in 1880. The NRA didn't reference, didn't raise gun rights. The first reference that I saw where they were raising it as an issue was in 1922, so more than 50 years after they were founded, and didn't embrace, call themselves a civil rights organization until 68. So no matter how you cut it, there are other groups that were civil rights organizations first. But the NRA has managed to bury its own history and keeping it secret, which is really quite an accomplishment, including an archive they have in their national headquarters uh, next to their, or beneath, I'm not sure, their firearms museum which is a secret NRA archives that has priceless artifacts going back to the 30s, including movie reels that no one, neither the public nor NRA members, has ever seen. Now, so despite that success they're, they're in lobbying... They're literally, oh, literally burying their history then, right? Literally burying their history. And that's on the, the back jacket of the book actually has that, has that in it, right? That's news. But... So they've been successful in their own terms. They've been successful in burying their history. So people think there's something that they've always been what they are or have been since 77. But the other thing is they're, they're having trouble today because, number one, they've overspent in the election of 2016, which has put them in a position they're still working to come back financially. Kind of like if you max out your credit cards, it takes a right. while to come back. Number two, the cancellation of the NRA annual meeting, which would be coming up. Uh, just this next weekend in Nashville really hurts them because that's their main fundraising vehicle for both uh, revenue from members, uh, sales, as well as uh, donations from big donors and gun industry executives. They've lost that. So they've laid off uh, 60 members or so of their staff, which is a layoff of that level is unprecedented. And finally, they face an ongoing invest investigation by the attorney general of the state of New York into allegations, and there's credible evidence that these allegations have some merit, 
of mismanagement or the or the channeling of funds that are that have been donated to their tax exempt foundations to the NRA's 5014 social welfare organization which can lobby which is not tax ex tax exempt which is a violation of both New York state law where the NRA is chartered as well as federal law and I think that investigation in particular is not going away on top of infighting that broke out last year between LaPierre, the, the, the longtime CEO, Oliver North, backed up by people like Ted Nugent, attacking each other over excessive spending, in which those allegations on both sides also seem quite credible. If you came to me in the mid-80s and you said Oliver North would be backed up by Ted Nugent and that would somehow be important uh, at the NRA, I'd have shaken my head. Uh, you know, I could talk to you so much about guns. Uh, the book is called uh, the NRA, the unauthorized history. Frank Smythe has the resume, uh, the journalistic resume that should make you want to run out and read this book. It's a, it's a cloak and dagger. I said it before, organization. We don't know as much about it, but we do know that they have a real hold on uh, the way we uh, exercise politics here. And I'd have many more questions for Frank, but hopefully they're going to be answered in the book. Frank, thank you for the time today on The Young Turks. Thank you, Michael, very much. Welcome to the conversation on TYT. I'm Michael Shore, and today joined by Albert Lee. Albert is running for Congress in the 3rd District of Oregon. Albert, thanks for being on TYT. I have to ask you a question. I've covered Congress for a while. Uh, I, I've gotten to interview Earl Blumenauer, who you are running against in a primary in Oregon, a number of times. Uh, he's not the typical member of Congress that you would see being primary. Tell me the motivation uh, for you. Uh, in, in trying to get his seat? Well, number one, thank you for uh, bringing that up. I don't think it's his seat. I think it's the people's seat. He just happens to occupy it at this point. Um, so really, in a nutshell, he's been in the office for 24 years, typically has a progressive voice and a progressive vote. But the reality is we need more than somebody that's just going to vote the right way. We need leadership. We need somebody that's going to actually push the envelope and get us to where we need to be. Case in point, Medicare, uh, single-payer Medicare for all. You know, if you've got Congress people, and I don't care if you're on the left or the right, if you're taking corporate contributions, that is swaying you. Okay, so he takes corporate contributions from health and in in industries. Uh, up until last fall, he was taking um, money from the fossil fuel industry, and to this day, he has millions in fossil fuel stocks. So while being a proponent for uh, single payer health care, while being a proponent for the Green New Deal, I don't see a whole bunch of fight coming out of him. And right now, these crises are for real. We need to do something right here, right now. And equivocating and taking the money and telling us one thing, that's lip service progressivism. Hey, tell me about that, because it's interesting. You, you brought up the time we're in right now, and how can you not? Uh, what would Congressman Lee do differently today uh, in, in the times of pandemic than he sees the congressman representing the third doing right now, and maybe even the Congress as a whole doing right now? Well, for one thing, they're uh, taking a little break. I mean, we're in the middle of an emergency. I don't see what reason they should not be uh, working right now to try to get a stimulus package to the people. And working in the first stimulus package, before they even got to the first stimulus package, uh, they decided to dump trillions of dollars into Wall Street to save the assets of the 1%. Uh, and then it took day, that was without deliberation. And then it took days uh, to deliberate on trying to get something to the people and while they did that, they snuck in another half trillion dollars uh, with no strings attached to corporations. And many of us are waiting for a $1,200 check, a one-time $1,200 check that's not even going to pay for the rent in April. So we've got millions of people that are unemployed right now. We've got food lines, okay? And then we've got, uh, we've got farmers throwing away food because they can't make a buck on it. Uh, these are serious times. We need to have serious uh, address to these issues. Um, one of the things about the COVID crisis is it is highlighting all of the different issues that are a very big concern. Our uh, for-profit private health insurance as employer base is just not cutting the deal. We need a single payer Medicare for all system. All of us being working from home has demonstrated that we can reduce the pollution uh, that is hitting our, uh, our, our country and around the world. We can actually do these things if we had the political will. Now, we're not going to have that so long as we have money in politics. We're not going to have that so long as we have corporate-backed politicians, career politicians who have been there for years, okay? We need citizen representatives who know the struggle and who won't take that corporate contribution and who will truly represent and fight for the people. 
Yeah, and Earl Blumenauer is one of those, uh, you could say, I think, a career politician, someone who's been there for quite a while. Seriously, I mean, uh, I haven't seen much action out of him in the last decade. He's been there for 24 years. That's longer than Vladimir Putin's been in office. Um, and quite frankly, uh, you know, a farm bill two decades ago, being good on bicycles and weed, that's pretty cool. But I mean, we've got a homelessness crisis that has been a crisis for a generation. We have the lack of affordable housing and living wages. And we have a climate concern where he says that he wrote the Green New Deal. Uh, but, uh, I, you know, I, I, I'm not seeing it. I'm not seeing uh, any real true action. We need to get the money out of politics. And the only way to do that is to elect Congress people, members of Congress that aren't going to take the money. You know, among Democrats, I want to ask you a little bit about uh, about Medicare for all. I want to ask you about the Green New Deal, most specifically Medicare for all. It had a national spotlight uh, this year so far. Uh, it it got a little bit of a rebuke in that the candidate and candidates who espoused it most uh, were not the ones who ended up winning the nomination. What do you feel has to be changed and what could a congressman Lee do to change the narrative around Medicare for all? Because when you ask people about it, the people really like it. When you ask them to vote for it, they don't. Uh, and again, this election is about a lot. It's turned into a referendum on Donald Trump more than it has uh, an issues oriented one. But how would you change that narrative? Up? Well, see, with the presidential election, we had over two score or a score of uh, candidates out there. Uh, some that were espousing different versions of Medicare for all, muddying what that truly meant. And I think that that confused people, number one. Uh, number two, I think that what was happening was you had folks that were uh, telling you one thing and then switching, and it was a bit of a bait and switch. Ultimately, in the end, I think it was a combination of mainstream media together in concert with the establishment of the Democratic Party that torpedoed uh, uh, Bernie Sanders and his, and his run. Uh Right. I, I think about the issue more, though. I think about, uh, you know, how whatever the history of what happened this year, it didn't happen, Medicare for all. But there are a lot of people that want to see it happen. What would you say has to change about the way that's done? I mean, listen, if, 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 even, even if the blame can go to the media, the establishment, Democrats, whoever, what would you do to change their effect on it? Then? you got to vote them out. I mean, that's the bottom line. We've got hundreds of good progressive candidates around the country that have been inspired by Bernie Sanders, that have been inspired by the squad over the last two cycles. Uh, we need to get a few more in, okay? You get a voting block in and then you got leverage, okay? You get a nice solid voting block at 10, five maybe, but 10 definitely, uh, you can start swaying uh, the opinion. We've got, you know, freshman members of Congress who have uh, dictated and shifted uh, the perspective Quite frankly, it was Bernie Sanders in 2015 and 2016 that moved the Overton window to making it not sound ridiculous in the first place to making it sound something that is feasible. And it's just another step to get there. Tell me about this. I like asking this of candidates. What was the moment, uh, you know, you could fill stadiums with people who think about running for Congress and don't. What was the moment where you said, you know what, uh, I, I'm going to run for Congress this year. I, it's time and I got to do it. But what, do you remember the specific moment? Yeah, I mean, the specific moment was a couple years back when I was putting a face mask on my daughter because of the wildfires here in Oregon. We live here in Oregon where we're supposed to have rainforest. Uh, and we've got we've had wildfires the last two years, not last summer, but the two years before that, uh, that were devastating. Uh, we, it looked post-apocalyptic. And it doesn't matter if you have 500-year floods every year wildfires every year, an entire continent, it seems like nobody seems to really care. Nobody sees the writing on the wall. And I'm saying something's got to give. We uh, need a planet for my daughter to live on. We need a stable country and government for her to live in and a life worth living. Those are three main points. Okay. You might think of those things as being super selfish, but I think at the same time, I think it's something that everybody wants. Yeah, for, for sure. I, and, and that makes a lot of sense. And I, I always like to know what that is. And that's a great image. I mean, it's a horrendous image, but it, it's, a, it's a vivid one. Uh, you know, you're going to have to appeal to people who have been voting for Earl Blumenauer for a very long time. You might even be among them. I'm sure if you've been in, and I know you've lived in Oregon a couple of times, but I'm sure you voted for Earl Blumenauer. And it's a guess. What do you say to that voter who, you know, isn't particularly upset with Earl Blumenauer, 
but, you know, could be had. What's the convincing argument? So there's a couple of different arguments. Number one, I mean, if you want to talk about, and they talk about seniority on a regular basis, the fact of the matter is we have a divided government at this point. Uh, there is no uh, Democratic uh, legislature in, in power right now. If you want to build up the power for this representative seat, it's time to switch horses at this point so that that person can can build up the uh, momentum to get into the positions necessary that when the Democrats do take control of both houses, you are in a position to actually get some things done. I mean, Earl's long in the tooth. I mean, he's 71 years old. He's been in there. He's been in politics for almost 50 years. Uh, the reality is it's time for a seat change, number one. Number two, I think a fresh perspective from um, someone from a different background, from a different uh, uh, um, life experience is necessary, especially here in the most diverse district of our state. Right now, we have seven representatives in the federal federal delegation. 100% of them are multimillionaires, part of the 1%. 100% of them are property owners. 100% of them are over the age of 62. 100% of them are white. And that's not representative of this state, where less than 1.4% of us are millionaires. 44% of us are renters. And a good chunk of us are below the age of 62. And a quarter of us are not white. So I think that it's time that we uplift some new voices. And that's a perfect argument. Can you tell me uh, briefly an interaction with a with a blue and Arab voter you've had where they say, "All right, you know what, you, you've you've sold me." You know what? I was walking in Selwood this summer, and I actually ran into somebody that was a classmate of Earl's, an an older woman, uh, walking her dog, and I gave her a handout of uh, my uh, uh, kickoff, and she said, "Well, you know, I went to school with Earl, and I I really love Earl." And I gave her the basic arguments. I said exactly what I said to you. And she said, you know what? I think you're right. I think it is time for a change. There's nothing in politics, I don't think, having observed it and watched it for a long time, more difficult than running against someone you like, actually. And and people who have done that and won uh, have said it was it was hard, but but it was necessary. And it feels like you're running one of those hard but necessary races. Is that how it feels to you, Albert? You know, I think that, first of all, competition is what democracy is built on. And number two, I don't think that we need safe seats. I think that we truly need composition in order to make sure that our representatives are held accountable to us. Uh, the combination of the money in politics and gerrymandering make for super safe seats, which make for less accountability and less true representation of the people. Your experience in the old guard, and we're going to get out right after this, so we got to make a brief, the old guard. How, tell us about that quickly and then how it's going to help you as a congressman. You know what? Uh, go, joining the uh, military was a thing that I did out of necessity. Uh, I had lots of school loans. Uh, getting into the old gar guard at Arlington National Cemetery was an incredible honor. Uh, we had uh, 14 to 17 funerals a day. Uh, it was uh, precision. It was discipline. And it was honor. And it was uh, sending off uh, folks who had served their country uh, and I, honorably. And I think that that... Uh, uh, brings to me um, uh, a certain modicum of respect, uh, an understanding of the sacrifices that a lot of people have made, right or wrong, regardless of the foreign policy, um, and have done for their country. And it's something that uh, is most important for somebody that wants to do public service. And did you walk the, uh, the Tomb of the Unknowns there? No, I wasn't a part of the Tomb Guard. Uh, I did uh, join the Quezon Platoon, which rode the horses uh, uh, and went through that training. What an extraordinary experience. Albert, uh, Albert Lee is at albertlee2020.com. You'll see the blazoned here, I'm sure. Uh, Albert, great luck to you. We, we hope to hear back from you and, and hear how it's going. Uh, congressional races are fantastic, and it sounds like you've got an uphill but a, a fascinating fight ahead of you. Thanks so much. Thank you. I appreciate it.